Great. It's my pleasure to invite our next plenary speaker, David John Gagne. David John is a machine learning scientist and the head of the analytics and integrative machine learning group at NCAR here in Boulder. Thanks again, David John, for accepting our invite and looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Anish. And here we go. Going to. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, comparing and contrasting physics robustness and explainable AI for seasonal, subseasonal to seasonal forecasting. Uh, if you are attending the Trustworthy AI Summer School last week, this, a lot of material here will be fairly similar. But but I'm going to try to ha have a uh, kind of more S2S focus and try to highlight uh, how physics robustness and explainable AI. I think play key roles, especially in, 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 in all cross weather and climate, but also especially in the S2S domain. I also want to give a large shout out and credit to Maria Molina, who uh, was my co presenter last week and contrib contributed uh, a lot of the slides on explainable AI. So, the kind of why are we interested in, in looking into trustworthy AI and all these different components of AI for S2S? Uh, Based off a lot of, especially research in recent years, uh, S2S forecasting provides a lot of opportunities for AI to potentially improve weather, uh, improve the prediction of different quantities at, at, at varying longer lead times, especially because our NWP models struggle to produce skillful predictions uh, in the S2S framework because we're kind of getting into the like chaos overwhelms the kind of initial condition signals. There's large scale forcings that offer predictability, uh, but how well they're captured, we're still, there's still a lot of open research on that. Uh, and there is a lot of data available. We have lots of observations and model output, climate model output, reanalysis uh, that we can bring to bear on, on, on the problem. Uh, but it's also a, a regime that offers many dangers for effective AI. Uh, the biggest pro problem is that the number of events in our S2S forecasting record is far smaller than the, di the dimensionality of event data. Uh, we have a very, like, for, especially if you're predicting things like kind of on an annual basis or things like, like ENSO phases, there's only so many, only a few events in the observed record. So uh, it can be easy to fit a multitude of models, many of which may overfit to the, that signal. Um, also, a lot, of, a lot of the interesting signals beyond the dominant ones, like in, so in, in the MJO, um, the, uh, a lot of the, the other kind of telecollections are fairly weak and, and don't have a maybe strong predictive power, uh, especially compared with, with some of the things you may use in, for shorter elite, like uh, short to medium range weather forecasting. Um, and this means that as tempting as it is to maybe try to apply your giant deep learning models to to S2S, and uh, there's certainly some been some good examples of how this can work. Uh, there's also also a lot of potential for overfitting and getting uh, not so great forecasts. Uh, so how do we? Uh, what's the path forward for S2S and in, in, uh, machine learning uh, or S2S machine learning forecasting? Uh, I'll argue that if we can incorporate uh, physics robustness and explainability into the system development, uh, we can build trustworthy AI systems uh, uh, for S2S that are effective and robust and, and will uh, hopefully provide improved forecasts and understanding. Uh, across different weather and climate domains, uh, there's been a lot of interest in machine learning recently, uh, and it's been driven by kind of the promise of machine learning in other domains like image recognition or uh, language translation, for instance. Uh, in these cases, you have some big data, giant, giant data sets of millions of examples that we can then feed into our giant black box AI. So the reality of what happens when you uh, kind of like this uh, internet connection issue, uh, if you're bringing in like all real world data sets, they're often very noisy and the AI model may, may or may not be able to distinguish the kind of some of the noisy or biased signals from 
like whatever the true signal is. And this results in biased and inconsistent predictions uh, and poor model performance, especially when you're trying to apply it in more of a real time setting. So in order to get around this problem, we, uh, we need to bring in not just fitting our machine learning model on uh, like on the data itself, but we need to bring in other assumptions and have ways of checking our model to ensure that that the predictions are well behaved and uh, work across a wide range of, of regimes. So the first area we're going to focus on is how to incorporate physics uh, ideas into an AI uh, slash machine learning training system. Um, the reason why we want to do this is that our uh, machine learning models are meant to optimize any kind of data. Uh, and uh, in doing so, you can, it's often possible to fit many different machine learning models if you spend enough time tuning them to get a similar accuracy uh, on a given data set. Uh, this is called the Rashomon effect because they have diff very different assumptions, but, but uh, on average will we'll produce about the same error in their predictions. However, uh, with all these models, there's no guarantee that a more accurate model or any one of these models is going to obey physical properties better. And some of them uh, are likely to, but uh, without any constraints, they probably won't. So if we can add uh, some kind of physical guarantees into the training process, we can constrain the set of acceptable models uh, to ones that, that not only have low error, but also uh, conserve mass or energy or use a like non-dimensional inputs or uh, other things like that. Uh, in the process, we can also maybe fail to find simpler models sometimes. Uh, so our, how do we actually incorporate physics into machine learning? Uh, you can do it throughout the, pro the, the pipe, machine learning pipeline. Uh, it can be as complex as, as simple as how you select your input and output features. Uh, this often is underappreciated, but very important uh, in how you like define the problem to make sure you have, like, have the right units, the right kinds of inputs, uh, thinking of the causal relationships between the inputs and the outputs, and trying to avoid variables that may be non-causal or uh, aren't, wouldn't be available at uh, like running in real time. Uh, doing kind of different input and output transformations, like same things as simple as doing taking a log scale or 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 looking at relative fact, uh, dividing by some kind of baseline value. So you, you have a relative prediction instead of a relative input instead of an absolute input. Uh, that can also make your model more robust in some cases. Uh, you can tune your machine learning architecture to take advantage of, stru of structure in the data. This is where a lot of deep learning gets its power. So using things like convolutions or current networks or graph neural networks. Uh, this can help reduce the dimensionality of the connections inside the model and also make for more robust models that can look for spatial patterns or temporal patterns on different scales. Uh, you can also constrain your loss function, uh, so lo loss function being at the end of the model, uh, to add things like you can ensure your if you're out if you have certain outputs that they need to conserve mass or energy, you can make that a penalty, as either a soft penalty or, or uh, a hard penalty to do so. Um, you can also compare latent states and make sure that like, like spatial structure is properly um, uh, enforced. Uh, there's also ways to train the model that, that aren't just using, I like, assuming independent identically distributed. You may want to group your examples as like time series and, and forward and back propagate through time. Sometimes that can result in a more robust model. Uh, some examples of, of how this has been used in practice. One is a climate invariant machine learning parameterization from uh, Buchler et al. Uh, in their case, they used a mix of kind of soft constraints on, well, on the loss function, as well as setting up the model itself to ensure that its uh, uh, inputs uh, are more climate invariant by using things like relative humidity instead of mixing ratio. Uh, and also enforcing mass and energy conservation to high precision. Uh, as a result, they, their uh, convective parameterization was uh, much more accurate and much closer to the truth without um, uh, kind of these large deviations that you can see in the convective heating profile. Uh, another uh, example from uh, Yanni Yuval et al. Uh, uh, they, they, did some other tuning of the inputs and outputs and how they 
like connected the whole system together to make it physically consistent and, and, and completely stable. Uh, in this case, they were also doing a convective parameterization, uh, but made sure to predict fluxes instead of um, like kind of absolute values of, of these quantities. Uh, they also diagnosed um, certain quantities from the things they predict rather than trying to predict everything directly. And as a result, they ensured every, all the quantities were consistent with each other. Uh, and, and this resulted in a stable model. Uh, they've gotten this working with both regular neural networks and random forests. Uh, for our own group, we've been work one project we've been working on is uh, emulating an atmospheric chemistry model. Uh, in this case, we initially used a, multi a regular multi-layer perceptron fully connected neural network. Uh, and after a lot of tuning, we're able to get a pretty good fit to the time series of our different uh, chemical species, uh, like uh, our precursor gas and aerosol. Uh, but you you'll notice there's a lot of spread. So we, we uh, just, uh, given random initial weights, we trained an ensemble of neural networks. Uh, so they capture a lot, the spread captures the, the signal, but uh, we're not capturing, say, this diurnal pattern in, in the data. However, if we train with a uh, recurrent neural network, uh, we're able to reduce the uh, uncertainty considerably and capture more of the dynamics uh, 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 better. So, so this is a good argument for potentially looking more into like not just fully connected models, but recurrent models and take advantage of that time series to, to get better dynamics. Uh, there are a lot of ongoing issues and I think physics-based ML is still need to be addressed. Uh, one is uh, like soft constraints on your loss function do not guarantee conservation or that the property will be absolutely obeyed. It will like reduce the errors in mass conservation, but because it's um, sort of iterative penalty, it, it's not, it, it's still not guaranteed. And if you need mass conservation, this can be a problem. Uh, it also, while it does increase robustness, it doesn't necessarily guarantee generalization outside of your training data range. Some, some kinds of physics-based AI does, but others uh, you'll still, you'll still run into issues. So this is very problem dependent. Uh, it can also sometimes require more inputs and outputs to the model, which would increase the model complexity. If, if you're trying to conserve mass or energy, you may need to predict all the outputs that, that go into the, the conservation equation instead of just the one you care, care about potentially. Uh, there's also the problem that I've run into a number of these cases where the actual, the physics-based models or observation data sets contain non-physical artifacts. Uh, they like don't actually conserve mass or energy. Uh, there, there's like in observations, you may not capture like, do, uh, like the right, you know, like high frequency information or the, the observations themselves may have quality control issues. Uh, you may have differences in like, if you're using sensors from different locations, they may be observations are collected at different heights, or you don't have the same sets of, of variables at different locations. Uh, and all of this can uh, limit how much of, of this other physics-based stuff you can do or requires a lot more pre-processing. Uh, next, we're gonna jump into robustness and talk about uh, some of the um, ways you can ensure your model has a bit more robustness. There's Obviously, a lot of overlap with with uh, physics-based uh, AI and with explainable AI and ensuring robustness. I want to kind of highlight a few things that were that that are more uh, directly in the robustness category. Um, some things we care about with with robustness, uh, in particular, is that uh, the problem that we often run into is that machine learning models that perform well on strats uh, like a static training and testing data set can fail to perform well in real world settings. So. Um, in some ways, uh, this is kind of a called transfer learning problem in that often the, the, when we like real world changes over time and it's not static like our, like our data sets. Um, so, so research questions in this area uh, include like how well does our machine learning model trained on one domain transfer to a similar but different one? And there's a lot of domain can be as simple as like train on one model, apply to another model, uh, could be train on observations apply to a model, uh, it, like train today, test tomorrow, uh, tomorrow could be very different. Uh, uh, as part of this, we, uh, we, we can see how well things, uh, we can try to measure how well our predictions are handling 
like kind of real world data by quantifying the model uncertainty. And there's a lot of ways to do that with varying degrees of accuracy. Uh, we also can run into the problems of our, the, the data itself, may, uh, especially in real time settings, we may be dealing with adversarial inputs or, or in, like either accidentally or intentionally adversarial. Uh, and that can cause our models to produce very wrong predictions unless we can control for them somehow. Uh, where robustness can be a, a major problem is uh, in what are called data cascades. So there's a lot of machine learning projects that look really promising early on, but then when they reach, say, the model evaluation stage or the model deployment stage, uh, suddenly the system is not performing nearly as well as it was uh, based off of our initial assessments earlier on. Uh, and this is often a, a consequence of things like brittleness when interacting with the physical world, not having enough application domain expertise as part of the development team, uh, sometimes conflicting reward systems where the what, what the machine learning model or the machine learning team is trying to optimize on is different from what the practitioners who are using the model actually care about. Uh, and poor documentation, especially between the developers and the the users or, or the domain experts uh, on how, how this model should and shouldn't be used. And th this can cause projects to completely run aground and fail in, in, in some cases. Uh, there's a great paper if you want to learn more about that uh, called Everyone Wants to Do the Model Work but Not the Data Work uh, by uh, Simba Sebastian uh, et al. So I encourage you to check that out if you want to learn more about this. Uh, on a brighter note, there, there, there are some examples where um, uh, utilizing multiple data sets can actually lead to better predictions. Uh, so there's a Ham et al. paper uh, from, from uh, 2019 that got a lot of attention. It was in Nature uh, on ENSO prediction. So their big result was they initially trained a, a convolutional neural network on climate model output and then refined it on reanalysis data. And the process found that their their model, the kind of orange curve up here, uh, outperformed all of the other comparison uh, models in their in their data set. Uh, they were all, I think, more physically based models, uh, and also retained higher correlation skill for a much longer lead time. Uh, and in some cases, was able to uh, have longer, basically, overcome the spring predictability barrier uh, to some extent. Uh, so this is a very promising result and has also kicked off a lot more interest in S2S uh, machine learning uh, research. Uh, another example from, from uh, my group, uh, we were interested in different uh, ways of quantifying uncertainty with neural networks. Uh, and, and this problem is more of a kind of uh, analysis assimilation type problem where we wanna uh, estimate ocean mixed layer depth from our uh, Surface uh, satellite and or, and or model fields of, of the of the ocean, I should say, uh, and we compared a bunch of different uh, uncertainty quantification methods and found that uh, the, some of the better ones are those that uh, basically assume a certain distribution, uh, like a Gaussian distribution, for the the predictions and predict the, and predicts the properties of that distribution. And this seemed to work better than sampling methods, which are a bit more flexible what kind of distribution they can represent, but tend to be under more under dispersive. Uh, we have an example of what, what uh, comparing our, a linear model, trying to estimate mixed layer depth anomalies and a convolutional neural network. And while it's not a perfect recreation, it does recreate the broader scale patterns uh, in the anomaly field quite, quite well. We also uh, run into uh, two other problems with, with our, our data that can limit robustness. One is uh, distribution shifts, where weather and climate data will contain non-stationary processes and artifacts due to both natural and human causes, whether it be issues with the instruments, like the uh, someone relocated a weather station, how the climatology has changed, uh, or satellite instruments degrade over time that, and, and become uncalibrated. Uh, our numerical models get upgraded on a fairly regular basis, and sometimes they'll tr change their systematic biases or how they represent, say, temperature or precip or, or other variables. And if the machine learning model is bias correcting on them, it needs, to, needs new data to learn the, learn the new biases. Uh, we also have the ongoing signal of climate change that is also causing our, our, our system to drift over time, and that 
uh, if the model is trained only on past climate, it's probably not going to handle future climate very well unless you can account for that somehow. Uh, there's also issues with weather observation and forecasting systems receiving noisy or corrupted inputs and outputs. Uh, you have data outages. We have things like animals nesting on instruments. Uh, example over here is a false crowdsource weather reports where someone spoofed the location of high wind reports to make the shape of Alabama and did some other uh, pretty awful things with, with, with the data where they had to shut down this uh, imping uh, crowdsource severe weather report collection system for, for a while until they could uh, uh, ad address some of these issues and do better quality control. Uh, so in any data set, it's like data processing, quality control, and knowing your data, visualizing your data is all really important to making sure you can avoid and account for some of these kinds of problems. Uh, finally, we're going to uh, touch on explainable AI. Uh, uh, the, the idea behind explainable AI is that uh, prediction error doesn't tell you enough about why the model is making good predictions. So there's a bunch of methods that can provide either post hoc explainability, where you, you kind of try to apply some of these uh, uh, like wrapper methods around the model to, to see by, by perturbing the input, see how it affects the outputs. Uh, you can also use inherently interpretable models that are relatively simple, but but can highlight kind of the essential features of the data set. Uh, one example is a partial dependence plot. This uh, can get, uh, allow you to see the sensitivity of individual inputs by varying that input, see how it affects the average prediction from the model. Uh, often it's shown as this kind of single curve that can tell you like where the sensitive range is. Uh, but the, as an explainability method itself, it's accurate to what the, a particular model is saying. Uh, but similar models trained on the same data may, may provide different results. So this one is a, an example for uh, a uh, surface layer parameterization model. Uh, and this one, we just changed the activation function, but otherwise trained on the exact same data. And we found that uh, there, there can be some significant differences uh, in, in how the model uh, behaves, especially um, uh, even within kind of the range of the training data, but also outside the range of the training data, we can get some very different extrapolation patterns depending on our choice of activation function. Uh, other ways to, to examine uh, uh, our models include permutation feature importance, where we uh, uh, permute or shuffle inputs to, to see how, how, if we take away that the predictive information from a given field, how much does the model error increase? Uh, you can do this in more robust ways uh, and get rankings of features. So it's fairly popular for that, but it, it doesn't necessarily tell you like why those features are important. Uh, so we we then can apply things like partial dependence plots on tabular data or things like saliency maps and other uh, kind of heat map type methods to, to see uh, like where in an image or time series uh, the, the key features are. Uh, so this is an example for, from a, a severe storm data set. Um, you can also look at uh, like an S2S time scale. We can use methods like layer wise relevance propagation to identify important areas of the globe that, uh, that contribute to uh, S2S predictions of uh, things like precipitation. Um, you know, these methods all have their own like assumptions and sensitivities built in. So it's important to compare multiple uh, like different methods and see if they provide similar or very different results. Uh, as you can see from, from this uh, uh, inner comparison by Mamalakis et al, uh, knowing what goes into your method is very important because it will affect what kind of result you get out of it. Um, so if you want to learn more about kind of XAI and a lot of these different methods uh, or AI Institute uh, recently put together a, a explainable AI short course led by Ryan Lagerquist. Uh, all the, if you go to our AI2ES website, uh, you can find out more about the course and, uh, and watch all the videos and Jupyter notebooks and whatnot. So with that, happy to take a couple questions. And if we need to move on, I can also answer questions in the chat. Thanks a lot, John. There's a great survey of machine learning methods and applications for S2S as well as weather. Any questions for David John? So I had one, oh, Chidong, go ahead. 
Well, this is just a uh, comment. Uh, when you mentioned the non-stationary data input, you used the word adversarial. And uh, I just want to point out that uh, uh, non-stationary data input will increase because the deployment of uh, uncrewed observing system. An uh, excellent example is the, is the Argo float. Uh -huh. And it will be more uh, in the future. So I hope that uh, won't be uh, adversarial in uh, machine learning anymore. So I think the uncrewed observing systems are offer a lot of opportunities for machine learning because because yeah we can gather a whole a much greater volume of data, uh, but yeah I think that's for those kinds of systems there's a lot of potential for them to uh, like knowing the potential for different biases or or like you know like different ages of floats or different kinds of drones collecting whatever information you have. Uh, no, having that expert knowledge of how, like how the data is collected and processed, and making sure uh, it is processed in a consistent way, and the standards and good data tracking are all very, uh, very important to make sure that any machine learning system built on top of those observations uh, will will perform well. And all the methods I mentioned in this talk should should apply to to those. We we use the Argo floats in the mixed layer depth uh, 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 use case, uh, so. So there's that definitely um, I think already finding it useful, but also under like dealing with the challenges associated with, with, with those kind of matching yeah, Argo floats and satellite observations and all the processing that goes in between them. Great. Thanks, Chidong, and thanks, David John. Andrea, you had a comment. Oh, you're, you posted a link to the S2S AI challenge. Um, which was recently announced, and I think some of yeah some of us on on the call today are also participating in that. Thanks for posting the link, Andrea. So I had a question, David John. Mm -hmm. The others. So it's related to one of the last slides you showed the work from Mamalakis. I think the. Mm -hmm one where you look at many different interpretable methods to see if there's agreement in what they find. Um, so oftentimes I feel like when the methods we use don't agree, that's when we learn something. Like for instance, um, like even one of the tutorials we had in this summer school on, um, on machine learning for interpreting prediction of two meter temperature over US. Um, Will Chapman led the tutorial and we found like ENSO is one of the main drivers. And also um, I think Libby Barnes's work also um, showed the same like in the plot you were showing. So learning that um, I guess is, is not something new that we, knew, we know that ENSO is a, a main driver. But something we would like to learn is new modes or new sources of predictability, right? And so would you have comments on how um, explainable AI, even if the signals are different, how can we learn new um, sources of predictability on S to S time scales? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Anish. And I've been kind of I say wondering that myself. Um, theoretically, the like like with with the right uh, you know, collection of heat maps, you, you like ideally you'll should spot new areas that don't make sense that uh, or like that that weren't found to be important before. But um, in my experience so far, most of the time the machine learning models tend to pick up on like kind of the most obvious signals, uh, and and because those obvious signals are often so strong that they. Um, they, they're, they're, they're li the machine learning model is liable to not really pay much attention to uh, other other signals unless you take out the really strong signals. Uh, and even then, like the the weaker signals are weaker by 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 definition. So it's uh, they're more likely to to have a lower signal to noise ratio and hard and are harder to, I think pick out. Uh, there's also a problem of confirmation bias where where you like kind of look at the the new the heat map and like oh of course i, I can yeah. explain this particular heat map uh, like there's obviously some some weather phenomenon there that, that is the, the cause but, but then you could generate a random heat map with similar spatial correlation and then show it to someone and it's possible that they could make up a story for that particular map too 
So uh, I think it's a, I, I don't have the solution to, to the problem yet, but, but I, I suspect it's some form of pre, like making sure you're, you're, you're pre-registering your uh, kind of what you already know or, or, ha or have some way to like robustly test like a hypothesis of that, that this is where most of the signal should be coming from and being able to account for that in order to fill, like eliminate the the already known and hopefully if you once you eliminate that then that might reveal the novel parts yeah. uh, i will say there are, there are also people trying to do things uh, other kinds of novelty detection techniques where they compare with they have some other baseline model that's like a linear model and then uh compare that with the neural network outputs and then where they're different that may be the the new signal uh but there's still a lot of there's still a lot of work to be done to to robustly find new signals and things that are that are different. So, um. great. Um, so Andrea had another question on the chat. Can you comment on the use of machine learning for calibration, dynamical forecasts, or inline model bias correction? Um, yeah, I mean. It, like machine learning uh, has been used for, for, for this for, for quite some time and follows a lot, often follows the pattern of classic statistical correction techniques like model output statistics. The main advantage of uh, say using a machine learning approach like a neural network over, over just like a bunch of linear regressions is that you may be able to use fewer or like one or like fewer machine learning models to do the bias correction and uh, so it may be able to simplify some of the, some of the pipelines because the machine learning models can learn regimes implicitly within their their structure, especially if it's something like a decision tree or a neural network, uh, and that can usually result hopefully result in a more uh, robust uh, bias correction system. Uh, there's certainly uh, issues with uh, if you if you have a very limited training set, then uh, the, the machine learning model is, is still uh, like you're going to struggle to fit a more complex model if you have if you don't have enough data. Uh, so so that's where things like reforecasts uh, come in really handy. Uh, I think that I'm working with different groups to also look at ways to uh, if you've already fit a, a like model to, to 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 like if you have like a large data set for for one model output and then a new a model upgrade comes along or there's another modeling system that's similar but not completely the same how how can you is there ways to to move your your retrain model over to the new system without com having to completely retrain the model um, i think this is this is a big question for I think a lot of the operational weather agencies that may not want to invest all the computing time and constantly retraining a bunch of machine learning models. So again, it's an open, I think open area of research and I'm not the only group that's also looking into this. So uh, uh, it's definitely a, a, a big open problem. Great. Yep. Thanks again, Andrea, for the question. Thank you, David John, for yeah, great talk and for the discussion as well after. So. Thank you, thank you, Anish, and uh, thank you everyone for for participating. Mm -hmm.